Hello, guys. It's Tuesday. Kind of muggy and rainy outside today. We're going to continue our story of how we roll, <clears throat> learning about Quinn and her family and why they moved and who she's going to meet with chapter two today. Where we left off yesterday, we had just met Quinn. We know that she has alopecia, which is um, causing her hair to fall out. And we know that her brother Julius has to go to a special school. I said earlier or yesterday that he was on the autism spectrum. Um, I don't know if they really address that in the book. If they actually call it by name, they might, but that's what it is. So if I messed up an exciting part, I don't think so. Sorry about that. You just know early. All right, chapter two. Quinn was trying to blend in with her new habitat, but Mr. Keller's home room had assigned seats and her desk was dead center. All through attendance, she could feel the eyeballs on her. It was mostly sideways glances, no outright stares, but still. The feeling of so many eyeballs made the skin on Quinn's neck prickle. It made her want to reach up and pat Guinevere just to be sure. Were five pieces of wig tape enough? What if she started to sweat? Quinn willed her hands to stay down. She focused her attention on the number two pencil in front of her. It's smooth yellow coating. It's perfectly pink, never before used eraser. Tabula rasa, Quinn thought, blank slate. That's what tabula rasa means, blank slate, slate. Tabula is slate, rasa, okay. Back in Colorado, there had been, dry, been a dry erase board on the wall in Quinn's kitchen. Every morning before her dad left for work, he would write some random Latin phrase on the board for Quinn to contemplate, which means think about. Carpe diem, ex nihilo nihi feet, vinci qui si vinci. When Mr. Keller began walking around the room, handing out our schedules, Quinn slipped her phone out of her pocket and texted her dad. Never got my quote this morning. Fortis fortuna adivat, her dad texted back. Fortune favors the brave. It was the first day of school, too, for him. He was the adjunct professor of class, classics at some college Quinn had never heard of. She wondered if he missed UC Boulder. She wondered if he was nervous. She pictured her sweet, dorky dad standing alone at the front of some lecture hall holding a stub of chalk, clearing his throat. McAvoy? Quinn looked up. Mr. Keller's face was round and white as the moon. Your schedule, put it in your binder. You might as well be speaking Latin. First period PE, 10 laps around the gym. If this were 408 days ago, Quinn would not have minded. She was born to run. Quinn's mom loved to tell this story about the first day she brought Quinn to diaper dance class at the Parks and Recreation Center. Quinn was two years old. Paige and Tara were two years old. That's how they all met in the multi-purpose room at the Parks and Rec the three moms with their three Starbucks cups and the three girls in their tutus and ballet slippers. Except Quinn had wanted nothing to do with ballet. As soon as she walked in the door, she spotted one of those rubber playground balls, stripped off her leotard, and began tearing around the room, bouncing the ball. Paige and Tara had thought Quinn was hilarious. They had stripped off their leotards, too, and started running after her. I remember there, too, so that's what two-year-olds do. In first period PE at Gulls Head High School, Quinn was the opposite of her two-year-old self. She was trying not to stand out. She was trying to keep everything on, nice and easy, slow jog, no sudden movements. So she's nervous because she's got her wig on and she's got to participate in PE. So she's nervous about her wig falling off or sweating and it falling off. So far, the wig tape was holding. So far, no one had called Quinn a freak or an alien or her personal favorite bald head. The girls running laps behind her were talking rapid fire. Oh my God. Did you see Nick at Ivy's locker? It was, he was totally waiting for her. That is like so sad. Is he still texting her 20 times a day? More like 50. My cousin Angela, when she broke up with her boyfriend, he wouldn't take no for an answer. And he kept like texting and calling and showing up at her house. She had to get a restraining order. Oh my God. Are you serious? Do you think he'll like Ivy? Oh, my God. Did you see her stalker? He's back. Apparently, Ivy had arrived. Okay, that's my best Boston accent, okay? Don't call him a stalker, Quinn heard her say. 
Then, I feel bad. I've been avoiding him. Immediately, they jumped to her defense. Don't feel bad. You broke up forever ago. You don't owe him anything. You brought him like 50 care packages this summer. It's not your fault he can't move on. I heard he could totally be walking by now, but it's like all mental. Wait, walk, walk? On his hands? No, dummy, on fake legs. They're called prosthetics. Like that sofa who got a shark attacked. That was her arm, not her legs. Bethany Hamilton. Wasn't she in that movie? Soul surfer, Quinn thought, but did not say. She knew better than to join the conversation. She knew without even turning around what kind of girls they were. She could tell by their, oh my gods. In the hallway, she could tell by the way they tossed their hair over their bare, tan shoulders, by the way their lip gloss shimmered in the light. Even though Quinn had never cared about being popular, had always found Paige and Tara's obsession with coolness seriously weird. When one of the girls jogged up beside her, Quinn's chin automatically lifted. Her stride lengthened. How are you? The girl said. She was wearing a blue tank top. She was small and golden skinned with brown curly hair gathered on top of her head in a big bouquet. Fine, Quinn said. You're new, right? She was at least five inches shorter than Quinn, but she matched Quinn's pace. Yeah, Quinn said. Ivy Darcy. She held out one tanned hand with fuchsia fingernails and a bunch of silver rings. Quinn McAvoy, Quinn said, taking it, even though shaking hands sideways felt like they were running a relay and she was receiving the baton. Quinn, Ivory repeated. It's my mom's maiden name. Weird, I know, but it could be worse. My brother was named after the drink she craved the whole time she was pregnant. Really? Yep. Orange Julius. Your brother's name is Orange Julius? Thankfully, no. Just Julius. Oh, Ivy snorted, laughed. I was going to say, yeah, younger or older? Younger. He just turned nine. Quinn passed under one of the basketball hoops, wishing she could stop and shoot 100 free throws. She didn't want to talk about her brother. Trying to explain Julius was like trying to describe color to a blind person. Paige and Tara understood. They'd known Julius since he was born. But Quinn had seen enough strangers stare at her brother in public. Most people had heard of autism spectrum disorder, but very few had seen a kid like Julius in action. Quinn could already picture Ivy's face closing up, her polite nod taking over. Hey, another girl appeared on Ivy's left, long black hair, red lips, crop top, and short shorts. I'm Carmen. Carmen? Carmen, right? I'm Lissa, a third girl materialized. Stick thin with silver leggings and corn silk hair. This is Quinn, Ivy said, the one all the boys are talking about. Quinn squared her shoulders, waiting for the punchline. In Boulder, the boys had been even worse than the girls. Quinn's so bald, you could rub her head and see the future. Quinn's so bald, Mr. Clean is jealous. After a while, Quinn had learned to ignore them. She learned to make her face completely blank, like a Botoxed celebrity, as though nothing they said could penetrate. This was a skill Quinn could call upon now. Her face was prepared for anything. You're pretty, Ivy said, squinting up at Quinn. Isn't she, girls? For real, Carmen said. You have the nicest hair. Quinn almost tripped over her own feet. Lissa said, is it natural? The spit in Quinn's mouth had formed a paste so thick she wasn't sure she could answer. But somehow she did. Yes, she said, which wasn't exactly a lie. Aesthetica human hair wigs came from real natural human heads. Could you just kill her, Ivy said, but she was smiling, touching Quinn's arm like they'd been friends forever. Excuse me. Across the gym, a whistle blasted. The gym teacher, a huge mustached man in shorts so tight they looked painted on, hollered, all right, people, circle up. Between first period PE and fifth period lunch, Quinn met three Emmas, two Avas, a Casey, a Kylie, a Kelsey, and a Chelsea. She met a Jack, a Zach, a Mason, a Carson, a Tyler, and a Darius. She met Mr. Fenner, a Ms. Chin, a Mrs. Wingender, and a Mrs. Winternitz. Every time someone told Quinn their name, she forgot it. There were so many faces. Everyone talked so fast. Nice to meet you, she said over and over. And Boulder, Colorado. And yeah, it's really nice here. In fourth period art, over a tin of shared watercolors, one of the Emmas said to Quinn, you must feel like a movie star. A movie star, Quinn shook her head embarrassed. Why? Because you're new 
and nothing new ever happens in Gull's Head. It's like the most boring town on the planet. As soon as Quinn walked into freshman lunch, there were the girls from PE, Ivy, Carmen, and Lissa. Come on, Ivy said. She literally grabbed Quinn by the arm and pulled her across the room. You're sitting with us. So now, here she was, sitting at a table with Ivy, Carmen, and Lissa, unwrapping her peanut butter and honey sandwich and asked, answering more questions. Where did she live in Gold's Head? What kind of music did she like? Did she cheerlead? Did she play field hockey? Was that the new iPhone? It was wicked cool. Wicked. They liked that word a lot. They also liked lip gloss. Balmy weather, Carmen said when Lissa asked what kind she was wearing. Bikini or sangria? Bikini, Carmen said, slicking some onto her lips with her little wand. Balmy is the bomb, Ivy said. Balmy is the bomb, they all agreed. Quinn took a bite of her sandwich and said nothing, because she had nothing to add. The glossiest thing she had ever put on her lips was chapstick. If Julius were there, he would launch right in with one of his records. The most lipstick applications in one hour is 535. Thankfully, Julius was not here. Thankfully, no one at the table seemed to notice Quinn's makeup deficiency. They were more interested in where she brought, where she had bought her skirt, Buffalo Exchange, and whether or not she had a boyfriend back in Colorado, not. Which brought them full circle to the conversation Quinn had overheard while running laps. You see that boy over by the window, Ivy whispered, in the wheelchair? Quinn turned around. Don't look, Lissa said. Quinn turned back to her sandwich. That's my ex-boyfriend, Ivy said. His name, Quinn was told, is in hushed tones, was Nick Strout, brother of, brother of Tommy Strout, junior quarterback of the varsity football team. There were two more Strout brothers who graduated. Football royalty, all of them. Tommy Strout was the most gorgeous specimen of all. Nick Strout, on the other hand, was a real-life tragedy. Why, Quinn said. Because, Ivy said solemnly, he was the best football player Goldshead had ever seen, even in eighth grade. And now he has no legs, Lissa whispered. Gone, Carmen snapped her fingers just like that. Sorry, guys. Sitting there in the cafeteria, Quinn felt every cell in her body standing at attention. She remembered Dr. Hirsch's words. The hair could grow back or it could fall out completely. We'll just have to wait and see. She turned to Ivy and said, What happened? Snowmobile accident. Roll over. He got crushed. Crushed, Lissa repeated. He almost died, Ivy said. Carmen pointed her finger at the ceiling and held it there. Don't mind her, Ivy said. What is she doing, Quinn said. Pointing up at God, Lissa said, like Big Poppy. Who's Big Poppy? Everyone stared at Quinn. You've never heard of Big Poppy, Carmen said. Quinn looked, shook her head, feeling stupider by the second. He's only the best baseball player ever, ever. You have heard of the Red Sox, haven't you, Lissa said. Yes, Quinn said, I've heard of the Red Sox. Did they think she was born under a rock? Anyway, Ivy said, Nick was my boyfriend, but now he's not. Now he's her stalker, Lissa said. He is not my stalker, Ivy said. He's just having trouble moving on. By the time the bell rang, Quinn had learned two things about Nick Strout and Ivy Darcy. They'd gone out for four months, three months before, and one month after the snowmobile accident that crushed his legs. Ivy dumped Nick not because, <clears throat> excuse me, an infection forced the doctors to amputate Nick's legs, but because Nick, who used to be fun and cute and crazy talented, seemed to have undergone a personality amputation, which was way worse than losing his legs. Now he was bitter and needy and, well, not the Nick Strout that Ivy had once loved, like, at all. This was what Quinn was contemplating on her way to sixth period study hall. Nick Strout's chopped off personality. You could probably call it ironic that the first person Quinn saw when she got to room 203 was Nick Strout. Unless this was some other boy in a wheelchair stuck in the, in the door jam. Quinn didn't decide to help him. It was instinct. She just bent down and tried to unwedge his wheel. What are you doing? Dark hair, dark eyes, ticked off expression. Sorry, Quinn said when she realized she was staring. He had no legs. Well, he had legs. They just stopped at mid-thigh, poking out of his khaki shorts and covered in those white stocking things. 
I didn't mean I was just trying to what he snapped. I, do you have a staring problem? Quinn shook her head. She knew what it felt like to be stared at. She knew better than anyone. It started with a warm tingle in your cheeks that spread like gangrene down your neck and chest and into your belly where it took up residence. Growing hotter and hotter until your whole body was smoldering. She'd felt all the time last year at restaurants, at the grocery store, in line for the movies. What's wrong with that girl? Why doesn't she have hair? Quinn wanted to tell Nick that she understood, but she couldn't. He was looking at her like if he were holding a pencil, he would stab her in the stomach. But he wasn't holding a pencil. Neither one of them was because Quinn's pencil had dropped out of her hand and rolled under the wheelchair. And all she could do was stand there stammering like an idiot. Sorry, I, I didn't mean, I guess I'll, I'll just, her voice trailed off and she bent down to retrieve her pencil. Yo, Nikki. From her crouched position, Quinn turned her head. There was another boy down the hall. He had the same dark hair as Nick, but he was older and thicker looking, wearing a football jersey and holding up a cell phone. What? Nick said. Mom's been texting you. Did you forget your phone again? Tommy Strout, Quinn thought, Jr. Nick said nothing. You have a PT appointment at 1230. She says she'll meet you out front. Tommy Strout, Quinn thought, quarterback of the football team. The bell rang. She had no choice but to scramble up from her awkward position, clutching her pencil. Hey there, Tommy Strout said. Hey, Quinn said. He smiled, slow and sweet and lopsided. It was the kind of smile that weakened the knees and stopped hearts, and it would not be happening to Quinn McAvoy of Boulder, Colorado. She could promise you that. Despite the fact that she had fairly nice legs, which she was pretty sure he had noticed, in Boulder, all anyone noticed was her head. Gleemo, Baldy Locks, Shaquille O'Neal. Quinn had half a mind to whip Guinevere off, kick her wedge sandals into the air, and yell, April Fools, but she didn't. She was Quinn McAvoy of Goldshead, Massachusetts, and she was going to make a dignified exit into study hall. As dignified an exit as a girl could make in platform heels and a wig that might or might not be sliding off. Quinn considered apologizing again, but Nick Strout wouldn't even look at her. He was shooting his death stare at the floor. And anyway, she had already apologized twice. Quinn McAvoy of Boulder, Colorado would apologize three times. She would chastise herself and feel like crud for the rest of the day. But Quinn was not that girl. Not anymore. Okay, so now we've met Nick. And we now know that it was an a snowmobile accident. And an infection actually caused him to lose his legs. I am so sorry. Apparently, I'm very much needed this morning. So, anyway... You guys have a terrific Tuesday. I will see you tomorrow. Don't forget to check your um, Google Classroom page and your do your daily check-in, everyone. And you virtual kids, do your daily attendance. See you tomorrow.